Okay, we're live. Hi, hi, everybody. Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, I am, uh, I think we're live, right? Yeah, we're okay. live. Well, welcome, uh, welcome back to this week's update. Um, I'm Aaron Hall, together here with uh, fellow attorneys Rylan Warner and Jennifer Howard. Um, we're just going to give some uh, brief updates on some news. There's actually a lot going on in the immigration world uh, as far as news and, and for a change, some of it's positive. So that's a good thing. And uh, then we'll try to get to um, as many questions as we can in the comments section. Okay. Um, so Rylan, do you want to start by uh, giving your update? Sure. Yeah. So uh, last week, I think it was on Thursday of last week, uh, USCIS, USCIS announced a new policy that they're going to be um, reconsidering applications that had been submitted uh, to a USCIS, USCIS lockbox between October 1st of 2020 and April 1st of 2021. If during that period, uh, the filing fee for that application expired because it was sitting so long in the lockbox because of COVID and all of the demand for, for mail, uh, there, there were just really long delays. And so USCIS is like, okay, we're going to try to do something good about that. Uh, additionally, um, if, if an applicant or a beneficiary or a derivative ate that was uh, submitted to a USCIS lockbox on a petition, uh, if they aged out of their eligibility during that period, uh, then they can also re reapply as well and resubmit their uh, application. And even if they have already aged out, they will still be reconsidered as long as you say, hey, it was during this period and we had to submit it through a USCIS lockbox. So it's cool that USCIS is is going to reconsider those those uh, applications. And if you think that maybe your application was denied because of one of those aspects, uh, we would really encourage you to reach out to our office to schedule a consultation and, and we might be able to resubmit that application for you on, on your behalf. Excellent. Um, Jennifer, do you wanna give your update? Sure. So there's a lot to unpack in my update, but basically yesterday, I believe, um, yeah, yesterday, the 16th, the Attorney General uh, Merrick Garland issued two decisions that are going to have a major impact on asylum law, and I'm pretty excited about them. Um, so the first one is vacating matter of AB, which was a decision that came down in 2018 from the uh, old Attorney General uh, Jeff Sessions, which... Um, essentially made it a lot more difficult for survivors of domestic violence to get asylum in the United States. Um, it, it didn't completely take it away, um, but I know I personally had some losses that resulted directly from the decision um, where the immigration judges were saying that because of the decision in matter of AB, they could not grant asylum based on domestic violence as a ground um, for asylum. And so now with that being vacated, um, we're going back to the former case law, which was a matter of ARCG, um, which states that domestic violence survivors do deserve protection under asylum law in the United States. So that's huge for survivors of domestic violence. Um, the other case that the attorney general vacated yesterday is matter of LEA. And matter of LEA was also decided by a former attorney general in 2019 under the former administration. And in that case, the attorney general said basically that um, a nuclear family, so if you were like family of so-and-so, that did not qualify you for asylum in the United States. That was not an inherently socially distinct um, particular, particular social group for asylum. And so now with that vacated, um, there may be stronger arguments that family or kinship ties would qualify somebody for asylum in the United States. Um, so both of these decisions are huge and open up more doors for asylum seekers that have been closed the last four years or so. Um, so it's really exciting news. Jennifer, what do, you, what do we think that means for uh, people who are in the midst of their cases for asylum? And, and also what about those who have uh, lost uh, in decisions that relied on those decisions, on those uh, prior attorney general decisions? 
So for pending cases and cases, I believe on appeal, the judges and the Board of Immigration Appeals and, and circuit court judges would be able to rely on the, the I guess, reinstated case law um, from these vacated decisions. And so that's really big for these people. I was actually just talking to Ryland before we started about what that means for people who lost, because um, I'm not exactly sure yet. Um, but maybe you know more, Aaron. Yeah, I mean, I think um, there may be uh, good arguments for uh, motions to reopen, uh, depending on the facts and the basis for the decision. And so um, I, I think that it's worth uh, for people who, who lost or who know people who lost their asylum claim, it's worth having an attorney um, go through the, the decision and see whether uh, whether a motion to reopen might be might be possible to, to reopen that case. That makes sense. Yeah, because there is the ground for like based on change circumstances. Change, 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 so. And Aaron, that, that would still that would be good, even if the the person that had applied for asylum is no longer in the country. Um, in theory, yeah. I mean, there's there's a bar to filing motions to reopen from when you're abroad and the regulations, but it's been ruled unlawful, um, and so. Um, it, it still might be possible. Um, the other thing I would note is that the Department of Justice uh, put out a uh, notice to their attorneys who litigate these cases at the circuit courts. So after a case has been appealed beyond the immigration judge, beyond the Board of Immigration, Appe uh, Board of immigration Appeals, and they told their attorneys to to look at cases that are currently at the circuit courts and see whether uh, whether they're appropriate for remand. Um, and so uh, I think there's a good chance for all the people who are challenging their, their cases at the Tenth Circuit and in other circuits to, um, to get their cases remanded and decided in accordance with, uh, with uh, prior case law, as Jennifer said. So that's um, exciting. And um, I was going to talk uh, quickly about prosecutorial discretion and then about U visas. So, um, on prosecutorial discretion, these are the updates I've been giving pretty much weekly, um, but it's it's really good news. Um, the uh, Department of Homeland Security attorneys now have their guidance on when to to uh, to use prosecutorial discretion. And when we say that, what we mean is um, basically in any law enforcement, the uh, officers or the attorneys have some discretion on when to uh, when to enforce the law. Um, I always think of it as um, if if there's a police officer on a corner and he looks across the street and he sees somebody robbing a bank and then he looks the other way across the street and sees another person jaywalking, he's probably going to let the jaywalker go and not worry about it. That's an act of prosecutorial discretion. Um, and that's essentially what they're doing um, now in the immigration courts. They're saying, well, we have 1.3 million people in a backlog for these court dates. There are lots of people who probably uh, shouldn't be considered priorities. And for those people, let's consider what actions we can take to get them off the docket. And so they are, uh, in certain circumstances, supposed to consider dismissing the case altogether uh, or maybe even agreeing to relief uh, in the case where the person can, can establish it. And so um, it's a real different posture um, than under the Trump administration where it was try to deport everybody you can, don't make any exceptions for anybody, was the basic rule. Um, and so for people who think, uh, who are in removal proceedings, um, that there are some strategy, strategy decisions that are uh, they're going to have to be made by, by the people and uh, who are in proceedings and their attorneys. And we are actually having an attorney meeting today, later today, to discuss um, what we have to do to, uh, to start making those decisions in, in um, in consultation with our clients. So uh, that's also exciting news. Um, just as exciting is the news on the U visas. Um, so a U visa is a visa that is uh, for a victim of certain crimes. And um, when Congress uh, passed the law that, uh, that um, allowed for the U visas, they said there can only be 10,000 granted per year. And as time went by, way more than 10,000 people qualifying for the U visa applied every year. So with those extra people, there formed a long backlog and it kept getting longer and longer and longer. And, and the estimates that I've seen lately have been, if you apply now, you might get your U visa in 10, 12, 14 years. Uh, so it's gotten really bad. 
Um, and while that's been pending, there is a way, uh, while those applications are pending, while you're in that long line, there is a way to get a work permit, but that was also really slow, many years until they even looked at your application enough to, to issue a work permit. Um, what USCIS, uh, the agency that, um, that adjudicates these applications said this week is, we're gonna change that. And as, so, as long as the case is prima facie eligible, meaning they have the law enforcement certification, uh, everything looks good, and there's a statement from the victim about, uh, about being victimized by the crime. Once we decide that, that it's prima facie eligible, we're not going to wait that long. We're just going to issue the work permit up front. Um, what that looks like as far as time timelines, we don't know, uh, but it should be much faster than it is now when we were waiting two, three, four years for the, for the work permit. So for people who already have applications pending, this applies to you as well. Um, they have a lot pending, so I don't know how quickly they're going to get to all these prima facie determinations and also for new applications. And what it means is uh, to me is, um, you know, there's still a problem with the backlog. It's still going to be a long time, but it really gives uh, some more immediate relief uh, in the form of a work permit and a grant of what they call deferred action. Uh, which should also, under the uh, ICE guidance, should also be a basis to dismiss any removal proceedings. So it is a it is a huge change and a really positive one for uh, for victims of crimes here in the United States. I think that's uh, that's what we have for updates. Um, do we have any uh, questions in the comments? Sure. There we only have two questions so far. We'll start with from Ronald. Uh, he said he heard that preliminary injunction is faster than motion for summary judgment. Does that mean good luck will get the, de the decision first, even after we filed our case two months ago? Um, no, it does not mean that. So preliminary injunction often is uh, the faster way to, to get a decision, and, and it is a preliminary decision when you get that. Um, but in Go, what we did was we uh, we immediately after we filed it, we reached out to the government attorneys and said, listen, we have this deadline on September 30th. That's the end of the year. And instead of doing preliminary injunction, let's all agree to an expedited briefing schedule on summary judgment. Um, and we agreed with the attorneys and then we asked for a status conference uh, with with Judge Mehta to get his agreement and buy in on this. Everybody agreed, including the court. And that's why the motion for summary judgment and the cross motions uh, are already in briefing and the hearing is set for July 13th and the decision could come anytime after that hearing. Um, so no, it does not mean that good luck will get a decision first. And in fact, I think quite the opposite. I think uh, Go is uh, set to get a decision first, likely. Of course, we can't predict exactly what judges will do, um, but uh, Go is already set. The scheduling is already done. And um, and I would not anticipate that uh, that the good luck uh, case would get a hearing even on the preliminary junction before our hearing on September on July 13th. Uh, so that's all good news. And um, and we are uh, still in the midst of uh, cross briefing on go, but uh, we're set for the hearing on the 13th. And, and uh, we will certainly publish uh, the way that you can either tune in or listen into that hearing. Cool. Uh, Amarildo asks, um, when we think that Judge Mehta will make the decision? Um, so this is, a, I assume, about Go. Uh, sometimes people are ask, asking about Gomez, which is the DV 2020 case. Um, and in Go, sometime after uh, July 13th. Um, we've uh, been stressing how important it is that it happens soon the whole time. We'll do that again on July 13th. Uh, Judge Mehta is well aware of, of the deadlines and how pressing the, the time is on, on this case. And so um, I anticipate that he'll, he'll work as fast as he can, um, but uh, I can't tell you exactly when. And he followed up. He said he is he's a GO plaintiff, so oh, that sure. was for GO. Okay. And Andre's asking, uh, how is it possible that GO already has the hearing date set? Yeah, just like we uh, discussed before, it's because we um, we agreed on a schedule with the government attorneys, and then we got a status conference with the court to to set the the schedule, including the hearing date. So that's how it's possible. 
Minna asks, are there any updates or communicate communication regarding the Cairo cases? Uh, I'm, I'm doing the Egyptian spouses one. I'm not sure if that's the specific one you're asking about. Uh, I keep, I, I left my contact information with the U S attorney's office waiting for the U S attorney to, to reach back in touch with me. I haven't heard from them yet. Uh, I haven't seen any updates. I was just checking this morning. Uh, there's been no motion to dismiss filed. Again, we do expect that to happen, but we expect that basically 60 days after we filed the complaint. Uh, so it'll it'll be towards the end of this month is, is when the Egyptian spouse's case will, will finally have the motion to dismiss. And then we'll have after that, I believe it's 14 days to file a response to that motion. Uh, and and we, we've been looking at all the motions to dismiss that we've been getting in other cases and, and looking at the arguments that they're using. And so even though we don't have the motion to dismiss yet, we're, we're still preparing ourselves for what we expect to see and how we can possibly counter what we expect to see. So we'll, we'll be ready for when we do get that motion to dismiss. Uh, uh, Jennifer, did you want to talk about the the other Cairo case? Sure, so for the Cairo K-1 case, we actually received the motion to dismiss in that case yesterday, and we have 14 days to respond, so we will be responding by the 28th of this month, um, and I'll be working on that next week. So, no other updates yet. But. Okay. Uh, Osama's asking if there's any movement on the GO plaintiffs. Yeah, we've had a few people um, be scheduled for uh, interviews that are go plaintiffs. And so we're very excited for them. Um, not in huge numbers or anything like that, but uh, we have, and then we've had uh, a lot of go plaintiffs uh, emailing me and, and using the update form uh, to update us on their correspondence and their efforts to get uh, scheduled. Um, a lot of them are, are pointing out the, um, the fact that the government might say that it's uh, KCC's problem in not scheduling the cases. Uh, and, in the, and at the same time, say that it's the consulate's problem and not scheduling uh, scheduling cases. And so there's a, a lot of contradictory information <laughs> coming from 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 the government, and and we're going to be sure to point that out uh, to the court again. Okay. Mike is asking, what did we decide on the Ciaro case? It might be the Cairo case. Just wondering if it will affect our Manila case K one. And I, I'm not exactly understanding the question of how the Cairo case could affect the Manila case. Okay, let's move on to Ronald DaCosta. He's asking, uh, can the embassy or KCC disobey or delay the court's decision? Um, no, they cannot. Uh, the, the government's not, uh, not typically in the business of ignoring court orders and, and they would not do that. Uh, they would not do that. And, in any of these cases. Uh, Ravina is asking, do we think that all GO plaintiffs will get adjudicated before September? Frankly, I doubt it. And, and that's the reason why when we, uh, when we crafted our ask for relief, we, we asked for two things. We asked for the, an order, um, ordering Department of State to, uh, to adjudicate visas before the September 30th deadline. Um, and, for those who can't be done before that deadline, for an order reserving visas to allow them to get their visas even after the September 30th deadline, uh, similar to what Judge Mehta did and uh, has indicated he would do in the Gomez case. Okay. From Natasha, um, she's in Brazil. In the Brazil lawsuit, got her NOA2 in May 2020. They scheduled all cases from the March and April backlog for interviews, but already keep making excuses and refuse to request my case be mailed from the NBC. Is there anything that we can do to force their hand so they stop making these excuses to not send my case to the consulate? I mean, that that's the, the purpose of our lawsuit, right? I mean, we're we're sick of them making all these excuses, and so we're demanding that, uh, let me, it's hiding all our faces. So we're, we're demanding that they, they do it by order of law, by, by the writ of mandamus. Um, I mean, we can keep pestering them as, as much as we want um, and keep our fingers crossed that maybe that makes a difference, but really the best course of action is through the writ of mandamus that we've already 
requested in that case. So, and until that gets finally ordered by the judge, there's not much more that we could do. Is, is, would you say the same, Aaron? Yeah, I'd say the same. The only thing you can do is continue to to contact them and keep records of it um, so that those records can be used in the lawsuit if necessary. Um, but yeah, that's the, like you said, that's the purpose of the lawsuit. James asks if we could give a general timeline for how a normal lit litigation case goes. Uh, knows the deadline for the government and Penn is this Sunday. So I wanted to know what we can expect once they respond with their motion to dismiss. Well, with the motion to dismiss, they'll have uh, there will be a timeline for response. The the, the court can set that, um, and um, the opposition I think is filed within 21 days um, typically. Although uh, I'd have to look that up, but um, but then uh, the government will have the chance to reply after that, and then there will be a decision on the motion to dismiss. Um, as far as you know, other things that can can come up during the course of litigation, you know, there can be other motions, motions for summary judgment, um, and hearing set. So, so it's uh, very much dictated by the judge who's uh, presiding over the case. Okay. Uh, uh, from Ronald again, do we see any kind of impact on go from other lawsuits? Have we seen? impacts on go from other lawsuits yeah i mean the um let's take a step back so there are uh, many many dv 2021 selectees and um and a small subset are plaintiffs and go um for people who aren't plaintiffs and go of course they also have an interest in getting their visa applications adjudicated and a bunch of them have joined in other lawsuits um the judges are all aware of the other lawsuits and um, they have made comments about them in recent hearings in the other lawsuits. And, and I think uh, the Jacob case, uh, Judge Chen, and then uh, also in the Rye case. Um, and so they're all aware, aware of the other suits going on. That said, uh, we did the, we, we uh, approached Go the way we did for a reason. Uh, we wanted to get it for some, set for summary judgment as early as possible on an expedited schedule. That's what we've done. And if there's any effort to have any of the other cases delay the proceedings and go, uh, we will uh, strongly oppose that um, because um, the reason that we've we've set this expedited schedule is because we need a decision uh, quickly for our plaintiffs. Um, and um, that shouldn't be delayed by any other lawsuit. Okay. Uh, Mike is following up on that question about the K-1 Cairo case. So, and its potential effect on, was this the, yeah, it, on its potential effect on the Manila case for K-1. So wondering if we decided to take the win because they missed their deadline or if we gave them an extension. Do either of you have the, the background on this question? So I, I was looking at that earlier today, looking at the dates, and it did appear to me that they had uh, missed the extension, but then it might have been a, a thing with the, the return of the service uh, that that was the date from which it was uh, supposed to be replied to within 60 days rather than when it was originally filed. Um, but maybe, maybe I was mixing up. I, I wasn't exactly sure. Yeah, Mike, um, I, I don't have, a, since I haven't been the, the lead on, on this case, uh, I've been, uh, I think uh, we've been working on this one from a little bit of uh, afar and, and some of the other people have been taking the lead on it. And so uh, I don't want to say something that's not correct and and, uh, and get ahead of, uh, of the lead attorneys on this. So I'm, I'm going to have to not answer that one. Yeah, I, I know that it, it was filed on the 9th of April but the return of the service affidavit of the summons uh, was filed on the 20th of April. So I'm not sure if that had an effect because they they did file their motion on uh, June 14th. So that would be more than 60 days after the 9th, but uh, it would not be more than 60 days after the 20th, which is when the return of service was, was filed with the court. Um, but yeah, we, we might have to, 
get back to that question at, at some point at, on a on another uh, Facebook Live. Uh, another question from Precious: If uh, she changes the sponsor, does she have to unlock her DS twenty sixty firm or not? Yeah, she means form. Do do either of you know that How, when you log in, if you uh, if you are changing the sponsor, if you have to, if you unlock the DS two sixty? I don't know. I don't yeah. know. No, I don't. I don't. I don't actually know that. Um, I think you would be able to just present a new sponsor um, at the consulate as long as the other sponsor was qualified. Um, but that's a pretty um, pretty circumstance specific question. So I, I, I don't know. Okay. Harish is asking uh, why is. DB2020 Select D Reserve Visa not being interviewed while DB2021 visas are being reserved but not interviewed and getting a visa. Uh, should DB2021 Select Ds wait for years after their visa is reserved? I guess that's kind of a, a moral question. Should they wait? Should they have to? Um. No, they shouldn't. Um, yeah, I, I don't. I don't get the, the question much beyond that. Um, the DB twenty twenty people are still waiting a final decision in Gomez, uh, or, or a number of them are. And uh, DB twenty twenty one, if they're beyond the fiscal year and they have visas reserved pursuant to an order from Judge Meta or any other judge, um, they they would have to wait until they can be interviewed and granted a visa. Uh, that absolutely shouldn't take years, um, and so uh, we would hope that it wouldn't. We would, we would hope that they would expeditiously, expeditiously process the visas after they're reserved. Okay. With cases like Milligan, have we seen the plaintiffs get mu movement before the judge has answered within the 60 days? Uh, John is part of the London K-1 lawsuit, and he wants... Uh, to be judged whether we may get some movement with the threat of being sued. He, would would being part of the lawsuit get movement on its case? Yeah, we, I mean, we've often seen that in the past where uh, where there's movement quickly um, because the government wants to moot out the case. Um, we have some indication through through some of the government attorneys that, that they've been directed by Department of State um, not to do that in in as many cases and and just to fight the mandamus case rather than uh, than uh, mooting it out through through getting the uh, case adjudicated. So I don't know that that will happen uh, in any particular case, including the London K one case, but it certainly has in the past. Uh, Ronald asking again why uh, we think that Gomez is taking so long. Do we expect the same thing to happen in 2021? Um, Gomez is taking so long because Judge Meta is very busy. Um, he has a lot on his docket and uh, actually a lot of high profile cases on his docket and um, it's it's not that quick for him to make a decision. And so um, I'm sure that he's working on creating an order that he thinks is is lawful and that would stand up to appeal and, and um, hopefully it'll be sooner than later. Um, I don't expect it to take as long for 2021 in part because a lot of the issues are the same uh, with Gomez. And so when he is done drafting the order on Gomez, then uh, that's going to be very helpful in crafting an order in, in Go, we would hope. Okay. And then Sally is asking, are there any guidelines yet for motions to reopen a case? Yeah, good question. So this is, um, there, there are in certain circumstances, uh, for example, for cases that uh, are going to be reopened pursuant to a Supreme Court decision called Niz Chavez, um, the government just announced last week that they're not going to, they're either going to join or not oppose motions to reopen if, if they're filed within 180 days. Um, and that's really important because some motions actually need to be joint in order to, to get past um, time bars. Um, so we have those. Um, and then beyond that, the, the guidelines that DHS have uh, on motions to reopen are more general. They're, they're just saying, let's apply our priorities. And when, uh, when a case merits prosecutorial discretion, uh, for whatever reason, then you, DHS attorney, have the authority to, to decide to join in a motion to reopen. 
uh, or to not oppose a motion to reopen. Um, so it's more general for non Mies Chavez cases, uh, but it's still it's still positive because uh, prior to all this guidance, the the guidance was basically no, never cooperate with uh, somebody who's trying to reopen their uh, their removal order, and so uh, it's a lot different than it was. Yeah. Okay. Well, that that was the last question from Sally. <clears throat> well. Um, it was a, a quick update. I'm glad we got to, to some questions. Um, we are going to get back to work on all these cases, um, but it's uh, it's always good to, to do these. And so thanks to Jennifer, thanks to Ryland, thanks to everybody who who uh, tuned in and, and put in questions for us. And we will be back next week at the same time in the same place. Thank you. Bye. Bye.